Um, well, we've got a great speaker that's coming up. Uh, I want to introduce someone who's, been, who's going to be talking about how data science is changing the role of the CEO. I'm absolutely certain he's the most authoritative person on this topic. First of all, he owns CEO.com, uh, a site for CEO information. Um, but more importantly, perhaps uh, for some of you, uh, co-founded and served as CEO Omniger, arguably, uh, or maybe not even arguably, right? The, the leading web analytics company. Adobe acquired it in 2009 for $1.8 million, and it still serves as that underlying service from Adobe to do, to do web analytics. From 2006 to 2009, the three years that Omniger was public before the acquisition, James was the youngest CEO on NASDAQ or, uh, or, or the New York Stock Exchange. And then Mark Zuckerberg came along. Uh, so but while this gentleman has matured, he's still at the center of action. He's now the founder and CEO of Domo, a software as a service company he started in 2010 to fix problems he saw in the business intelligence market. There's a lot of buzz around this company. He just told me that they have 350 customers. I don't think that's public, it hasn't been talked about. It's actually a company that's still in stealth. You have to sign an NDA and become a customer of Domo. Uh, he has raised six, $6.3 million in venture capital from Benchmark, IBP, and others. So please welcome Josh James. Hey guys, good to be here. Uh, raised $125 million in venture capital, just a little clarification. Uh, and uh, we'll probably raise some more. We, uh, Data, I mean, this is something I've been doing since 96. Right? We started out uh, originally as a website development company, and we make these websites for people. We were in college, and you know, some bank would pay us a couple hundred grand for consulting, and we were building people out at 125 bucks and paying them bucks an hour. It seemed genius. And uh, you know, then they'd all ask, well, what in the world's going on? Because I spent a couple hundred thousand bucks on a website, what in the world's going on? So we. We're trying to we try to install these different software applications to manage the data, and everything just fall apart. You know, something get mentioned in USA Today, the traffic would double, and everything would fall apart. And so we started what we call remotely hosted software. We were actually the very first software as a service company, and uh, doing this remotely hosted software, um, we started seeing traffic just go through the roof. We were actually we did free analytics. Shocking. Uh, we were a little ahead of its time. We couldn't support it because we didn't have a a giant uh, search engine to support the free analytics. But anyway, um, kind of built this thing into this enterprise analytics company, and, and uh, then as I mentioned, we sold it. And towards the end, one of the things that would happen to me is, um, I guess there's a, you know, we've been doing data, for, I've been doing data forever. And one of the, I've been CEO for almost 20 years now. And one of the things that would happen towards the end is I would go, I remember going to Expedia. And I'm meeting these guys working in Expedia, and they were doing so many interesting things with their data in real time, right? And they were finding out things like uh, people would go and try to buy travel, and then they would try to they would try to sign up as a new customer. They put a username and password in, and they forgot that they were already a customer. And they put that username and password in as a new customer. They would throw them out of the whole process, and they lose the sale. And they tracked this down, figured it out, and we broke like $60 million in revenue just that one fix. And I was so impressed. Like, this is so cool. We're making so much money on our products. And I remember walking out and wondering, I wonder what we're going to do in sales this quarter. I have no clue. I don't know how many employees we have. Because I, I know we've been hiring like 25 a I wonder if we've hired them. No clue. I wonder what our cash collections are. You know, it, it, invariably, we originally started out, I did these monthly reports, and I created them. Like, here's all of the data that I want every month. And then it goes to once a quarter as we get bigger. And then once we're public, you know, it's once a quarter, but any of my requests are behind the CEO's requests, and the CFO's requests. And I remember one in particular was driving me crazy. My VP of sales would always tell me, well, we got to hire bases base in San Francisco, LA, and New York. Why? Well, because it costs more to live there. Well, what do I get out of it? Do we, do we sell more there? Like, can we do an analysis? Do they, do they hit higher quotas based on the higher bases? Because they're in a higher, you know, per capita um, and concentrated area? And I never could get an answer to this question. 
And uh, so then we sold to Adobe, and I remember sitting at Adobe, and when it was apparent that I wasn't the muted very long, I remember sitting in the meeting, <laughs> and, and uh, I was listening to the CEO, and he was asking questions about things that he wanted, and I was struck me, like, so I've been a CEO of a tiny little startup. I've been a CEO of a $500 million company. Now I'm sitting here and I'm on the executive team, you know, in a company that's doing $4 billion of revenue. He has all the same questions that I have. This is crazy. Like, how do we not know what's going on in our own businesses? Why do we, I know who to call. I definitely know who to call. You know, and I call my head of sales and he's got to call somebody. I call my head of marketing, she's got to call somebody. What, what's, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. So that's when I set out, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go and try to figure out how to help really the executives of the organization, get the information that they want, and I'm gonna take an approach from, from really from a business standpoint. So, you know, that's where I think, you know, data really has been the big secret. It's like, you can't get access to it. And then everyone starts talking about big data and small data. And I don't care about any of that stuff. Just give me my data on my phone, send me a text message that says your pipeline changed by $200,000 a day. That's really what I want. You know, you had four customers go to code red today. That's what I want. I don't want to click on it and I want to see what happens. And I don't want it to be 25 different systems, right? So that's kind of what we set out to do. And I realized as we started looking at this, there's a, there's a lot more, uh, it's not just me. We have 70% of CEOs say that they lack real time access. And this surprised me a little bit because I, I would guess this would be like 90%. And then I had a meeting with um, one of the top 20 banks in the country. And we're sitting there with the CEO, the CFO, and their executive team, and we're pitching our products to them. And the CFO says, he's really grouchy, curmudgeon, right? He's like, oh, why do we care about this? Why do we care about real time data? I don't need my data. I mean, once I'm three, four days into the quarter, I know what my quarter is going to be. So why do I need my data more than once a quarter? I don't need my data more than once a quarter. And I started laughing. <laughs> just right there, I just started laughing. Because I thought for sure it was a joke. And then it wasn't a joke. And then it was really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's like, <clears throat> what are you talking about? Are you, are you out of your mind? And we walk out of the meeting, and three of his guys come up to us. The guy that runs corporate loans, the guy that runs personal loans, and uh, one other individual. And they come and say, you know, we would love to have a real time data. We could probably make three or four million dollars a day just by having access to what our loan rates are in all of our areas relative to what the competition's loan rates are. And we subscribe to the service that gives us the competition loans, and it's in this Excel spreadsheet, and we can look at it at the end of the day, but by then, we've had a day of our rates being sometimes too high and sometimes too low. You know, so I'm like, okay, maybe this number actually is higher than 70%. There are some idiots out there that think that they really don't need data more than once a quarter. And I think that's fair to classify them as idiots. Um, you know, other thing, 93% of CEOs and executives have access to data don't trust the data. And they're also concerned that they can't really make sense of it. And we found there was another piece of data that we triangulated on this. There was another a survey that was done. And it said 7% of executives feel like they have the right tools to use the data once they have it, the right skill sets. Because still, when you get data, it's like some data jockey gave it to you. And it's like they're purposely trying to make it difficult. You know, you hear about all these companies out there that have these products you can go and download for free and try it out. And I was like, oh, cool. Maybe I can do that little HR analysis of base pay. And you go to the website and you download it in about four seconds. And I'm like, huh, help. You know, I need a lifeline here. I need somebody to come and figure out what all these acronyms mean. I have no clue. So all of this data is getting served up to business users and it makes no sense the format that you're getting in it. I don't want a format, I want it to be, I want it to be web easy. So that's the other opportunity. And then I thought I'd share, I know there's some entrepreneurs in here and, and uh, I thought I'd share a, a little story. Uh, this is, you know, it's, 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 this is not an uncommon problem or un, um, you know, problem that people aren't aware of. Everyone's aware of this. And we found this out when we started, um, I was originally thinking I'd just fund this business myself and, just grow it and you know, own 98% of it when we took it public. That sounded really sexy. Um, but then I got sued by Adobe, which kind of sucked. And I felt like it was me against the world. And then I had some VCs that I was friends who were calling me. 
And uh, they, you know, I was like, you know, maybe I should get some people in my corner. And it made me, it made me uh, ten times more agitated because now you know you got some of this looking over your shoulder and you're concerned about you want to make sure you're making the money and do right by them, etc. So it's been good, but um, this, the the way this came about was I thought really telling in terms of how how obvious the problem is. And so when we went to some VCs, um, and I remember calling my friend, I said, you know, what do you think I should raise money on? He's like, well, there's some guys coming out of Google that are raising money at you know 50, 60 million bucks, and some, some engineers out of Facebook that are getting 60 million dollar valuations. I was like, well, okay, well maybe maybe I can go get something like that. That'd be kind of cool. And um, uh, because I was getting sued there for a while, I kind of lost my confidence. I felt like my name was getting dragged through the mud, and it was just like, I lost my mojo. And I was talking with my friends, and I was, and I was telling them, like, yeah, we will try to get a 50 or 60 million dollar valuation. It's just a PowerPoint, you know, but we did it before, and that was really cool. And if we can't, maybe I'll settle, maybe we'll go okay with third. And he's like, what's wrong with you? I don't even know you. They're like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, they're engineers going to be CEOs. You're a CEO, gonna be a CEO? Like, Go get higher valuation. Like, yeah, what's wrong with me? I really messed up, you know? And so I'm like, so I start calling people. I'm like, hey, we'd like to get a $100 million valuation for this PowerPoint. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> really, it really didn't work out very well. Right? Right? The first couple of months, they're like, you're out of your mind, man. You know what's going on? Like, what are you talking about? I was like, okay, or got to kind of change my story. So we go to the next one, and we start getting a little attraction. And, uh, have a company to say, okay, we think we'll, 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 we'll hit your $100 million mark. And um, you know, we'll invest like $10 million. I'm like, great. Now, can you give us a week? I'm like, yeah, sure, you can have an exclusive week. So we go through the process, and we get to the last day, and he's like, we need, we need like two more days. Like, okay, but you know what I told you. I will give you a week. He's like, I know, I know. And so then, now I've got offering in hand, closing in two days, like this is fun, right? So I call some other VC friends. I text them, I'm like, yo, um, you know, I got a deal. Looks like it's gonna close in two days. It might not, it might not, but you know, I'm not BSing you. And he's like, yeah, come down. So we go down and uh, went down to benchmark. There's guys that end up funding us. And um, I haven't really told the story yet because it wasn't apparent we were gonna do really well. So you don't want to embarrass them. But now it's starting, we're really getting a lot of traction. We're selling like three million dollars a month in uh, new contracts, you know, the annual annual value of those contracts. So we're we're starting to crank, but Anyway, so I go in there and they say, uh, we go through the presentation and they're like, this is a huge problem. Like we've seen this problem in every single one of our companies. We never know what's going on. We gotta wait for you know, once a quarter reports. I wish we had access to data like this about our companies. Right, it resonates with everybody. How do you make a connection? How do you make a really good user, you know, user interface? And we had answers for all these things. So I've been doing data forever, right? And so we get done and uh, he basically, they only had one question. They're like, you know, what, why, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why don't you go for golf or do whatever? Um, which, you know, kind of feels like a personal front to me. I don't want to go sit around and do nothing. But um, I, I said, I want to make homage look at that cute little thing that we did when we were in elementary school. And, you know, this next thing is the thing. And uh, they liked that answer. It wasn't, it wasn't pre-scripted or anything. It's just how I feel, right? And um, but they were really excited about the space. And then we get done and he's like, hey, can you hang around for a few minutes? I said, sure. So I hang around for a few minutes. And he's like, this, this was like, I felt like I was in a Hollywood movie, it was so cool. He comes in and he's like, hey, um, we're, not gonna, uh, we're not gonna screw around here and try to tell you, you know, this is why we're better than the next guy. We're gonna give you a better valuation. You shouldn't be raising 100 million. You know, we're not gonna offer you, I mean, $10 million, like, that's for wusses. You know, and $20 million, you're still just swimming around. You know, he's like, that's the best part. He's like, you're Josh effing James, and you need 30 effing million dollars, and we're gonna effing give it to you. And I was like, what? And I'm like, okay. He stands up, shake hands, that's it. Two weeks later, we're funded. Um, but I got home, I told my wife the story, she's like, yeah, you need to not think about that around, because I really would get it down. <laughs> you know, pick up the kids. Um, but anyway, it was just cool to see how big, you know, the space is and how aware everyone is of the space. How big the problem is. Yeah, data is interesting. You know, it's never been interesting what the acronym or the buzzword is. It's only been interesting 
how you make money out of having access to that data, and how quickly you can get that data, and how quickly you can get that data to the executives, um, and how you know sure you are that that data is accurate. So, you know, at Bill, when we sit out, I mean, basically, this is kind of what I felt like my life was, or something like this. The data is all over the place. It's on the desk. It's in spreadsheets. It's in PDFs. It's in software and service tools that you use. It's all over the place. And we basically put it all on your phone, on your iPad, on your web browser. And whether you get that data out of you know, Salesforce, or QuickBooks, or NetSuite, or SAP, or your proprietary database, it now all looks the same. It's uniform. It's actionable. It's alertable. It's you know you can build any combination of um, charts and graphs that you want, and uh, you know you can start managing by exception. And that's the thing that I always thought was interesting is like I want to go on vacation, and I don't want to have to look at 30 emails every night to know that the thing is still on the tracks. I want to get a text message from the three things that are outside of you know my parameters. And everything else, if I don't hear about it, I know it's within those parameters. That's what I want. And I think that's what every executive wants for their businesses. So that's what we went out and tried to build. And really, when you, when you think about kind of what's next, I think it's really about this transparency. And it scares people, right? I mean, it scares people. Especially the bigger the company we talk to, the earlier on in the conversation we hear from customers, well, how do you control access to the data? You know, and it's an important topic, for sure. And we have all kinds of access controls. But you know, it's interesting to kind of see the, the higher up in the org you get, the older of individual you're talking to you get, the more you hear about control and access control and make sure that no one sees something that's not approved by the office of the CFO because they might take it and extrapolate something out something crazy, right? And so we've had to kind of come up with ways to be able to say, okay, this one's not approved, but it's still data and it's real time. And we can all take a look at it, have conversations about it. And you know, the other way that we think about it is like, a lot of times we we'll talk to somebody and someone will say, uh, oh, you guys, that's, that's kind of like BI. We don't think we're doing BI. I mean, we're not gonna, I'm not going to talk about everything we're doing. But um, you know, it's definitely, that's one area that a lot of our customers come from. And uh, sometimes we'll say, oh, before we do anything in that area, we've got we to do a big data warehouse project. We got a $35 million data warehouse project we're going to build the next 18 months. And then after that, we're going to start trying to figure out how to really do our, our, our business intelligence. <laughs> what? That doesn't make any sense. Crazy? That's what they're doing, right? And then, um, you know, you go and you think about, you go and you think about BI, and now they're talking about how to, we've got to figure out all the things that we want to collect, all the things that we want to report on. And then once we figure all those things out, then we'll start really trying to figure out uh, which vendors we should think about working with. And we flip that on its head, I think it should be flipped on its head, to where bite-sized little increments, bite-sized little pieces, there's not some giant risk where you gotta go out and say, here's our big BI project and it's perfect. I was talking to one of the top five uh, tech companies in the world and talking to their head of business intelligence, and he told me very, very proudly, we collect 85% of the data that we want to collect and have it available in our BI system. We have every BI software under the sun and we think that we're doing a better job than anyone in the industry. We're so proud of that number. <laughs> really? That's crazy. How do you make decisions like that? That doesn't make any sense to me. You know, and all this data lives digitally. Why is it so hard, people? So um, I think there's just a, you know, you think about um, the BI space, everybody got bought at the same time. All these billion dollar companies got bought at the same time. The software is a certain, the small software is a service companies. We're basically just trying to go and replicate the stuff that didn't work. By the way, 80% of people who use BI are dissatisfied. So this, this, is, this is a space that was really ripe for coming in and, and really disrupting. And I think uh, you know, one thing I'll say is like, for a lot of people, it's really uncomfortable. Um, but for those that kind of get on the bus, you know, there's just so much opportunity. And we saw this with Omniture. And we had 6,000 customers. It's a billion dollars in business today. Um, and it created a brand new space. And we saw so many people start to figure out how to use data to manage their business, and then they would get promoted and promoted and promoted and promoted. And you know, now I have tons of customers that started out as data analysts that are CMOs of companies. And we think the same thing is going to happen more broadly speaking in your business. Those that drive for analytics and have zero patience for someone saying, you know what, we'll get that to you next week. What? The data lives digitally, right? 
go get it for me right now. Let's figure out how to get access to this data right now. And uh, you know, those that do that, I think, are going to are, are going to really be the ones that benefit. So, let's change the game together. It's 20 minutes. Peace out. Thank <laughs> you.